The title of our sermon this morning is God's Grace at Rope's End. God's Grace at Rope's End. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 8 through 11 this morning. Having set the stage in chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, we now move on to a practical example, a practical illustration, if you will, that Paul gives us beginning in verse 8. Now, as Acts 18 records, Paul spent a, a grueling but fruitful 18 months in Corinth, preaching the gospel to Jews and the Gentiles, and he planted the church at Corinth, and he established that church there. It's a fledgling church, and as you would expect after Paul's departure, as he said to the the Ephesus, the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, just as in that case, after Paul has left Corinth now, savage wolves have come in among the flock, so to speak, not sparing the flock. They've rose up from within, speaking perverse things, drawing away disciples after themselves. And in doing that here, they have specifically determined to discredit and undermine Paul himself and his authority as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now these false teachers, these false apostles, began criticizing Paul publicly. They slander him, they gossip against him, they spread lies and accusations, it's what lost and divisive men often do. They were essentially saying that Paul can't possibly be an authentic apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's ministry doesn't reflect a ministry that is approved or blessed by God. Paul's, Paul's physical presence is weak. He's not a good-looking guy, right? He's... Uh, has physical infirmities. Um, Paul often and likely suffered under many physical infirmities, and much of that was as a result of the persecution that he faced. They said that Paul's speech was rude, that Paul's speech was contemptible. He wasn't a good speaker. In other words, his pulpit ministry didn't match up to the bar that they had set for Paul, didn't meet their standards, and they thought that it was shameful for Paul to do manual labor and to refuse pay from the Corinthians. And they felt that at the same time they were saying it was shameful for him to do manual labor and not take pay for his speaking, they thought that he was deceiving the Corinthians out of money, taking the gift that they were given for the poor in Jerusalem. So they thought that Paul was shameful. Now all this was said about Paul while these false apostles claimed to be true and genuine apostles. They were being touted as super apostles, in fact, boasting of their eloquent speech, boasting of their superior wisdom, even their outward appearance, they said, was better than Paul's. They preach and teach for pay, which would be expected of a public speaker or a public leader. All the while, all the while, they're spreading lies, teaching error, sowing discord, being divisive, and as Paul says in Corinthians, devouring the Corinthians. They viewed their wealth, they viewed their stature, they viewed their abilities and their growing following they viewed all of that as evidence of God's blessing on their ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, Paul says that such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. It sounds like characteristic false teachers in our day, doesn't it? Great public speakers. They know how to turn a phrase, right? They know how to get a sound bite. The consummate glad hander. The politician. Always seeking to encourage, never seeking to offend. White teeth, perfect hair, right? Perfect complexion. A gleam in their eye. They accumulate wealth. And they use that wealth, bilked off the people, fleecing the flock, as evidence for God's blessing on their ministry. And their ministries grow, and their ministries grow, and their ministries grow. They fill mega churches in multiple locations. They seek the approval of the masses, not the approval of God. All the while, all the while preaching, as Paul says, a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel. However, above all of these false accusations against Paul, the primary accusation that they level against him is that Paul suffered far too much to be considered an actual apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul suffered too much. 
suffering, they would think, was a sign of God's judgment, a sign of God's disapproval, a sign of God's anger, a sign that you were doing something wrong. Hardship or adversity, affliction, is due to sin or a lack of faith, a lack of faithfulness. You're going through that kind of persecution, that kind of adversity, you can't be faithful. Obviously, you're doing something wrong. Affliction is a sign that you're on the outside, and that God is punishing Paul for his sin, punishing Paul for his lack of faithfulness. So how does Paul respond to this? So we work through 2 Corinthians, we'll see a lot of Paul's response to these false accusations. But in this case, the very accusation they spread around Corinth to shame him, Paul sees as a badge of honor. What these divisive liars see as evidence against Paul's ministry, Paul sees as validation of his ministry. To the point where Paul says in chapter 11, if I have to defend myself for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of these dear people, then I will boast, Paul says, in my suffering. Paul isn't shamed by his suffering. Paul lays his suffering out without hesitation. In stripes above measure, he says. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. Five times, Paul was beaten within an inch of his life. He was stoned and left for dead in Lystra. A night and a day he spent floating around lost in the ocean. Can you imagine? In near constant peril, Paul says, in near constant exhaustion, hungry and thirsty often, and in all that, constantly concerned about the churches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says we are in much tribulation, we're in need, we're in distress, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, slandered as evildoers and deceivers, poor and having nothing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he is reviled, he's persecuted, defamed, and dishonored, condemned to death. He's made a spectacle before the world, a fool for Christ's sake beaten and homeless. Paul says we are made as the filth of this world, as the off-scouring of all things. And then here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul extols God in praise for the very same suffering that his opponents are pointing at to shame him. In verse 4, he shows how that suffering enables him to minister more effectively, and his suffering and comfort is for their comfort in their suffering And then in verse 8, Paul immediately references the single greatest and most terrifying incident of suffering that he has ever experienced to this point. Verse 8, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Why does Paul respond this way? Why does Paul think this way? The reason that Paul responds and thinks this way is because God is glorified in demonstrating the surpassing greatness of his grace and his power in man's weakness. God is glorified in Paul's weakness. God is glorified in Paul's suffering. Paul says in chapter 4, that we are like fragile clay pots so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Suffering as a Christian isn't meaningless. Suffering as a Christian isn't an indication that you're doing something wrong. Suffering is a validation of the Christian life. Suffering is essential to the Christian life. The Lord said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, Peter explains in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, that we go through various trials, right? We experience various trials so that the genuineness of our faith, which is much greater worth than gold, may result in praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, that is meaningful, isn't it? That's a great reason to rejoice in our suffering, isn't it? There's purpose to our suffering. There's meaning to our suffering. Now, before we get into our text, let me give you three purposes or three reasons that Paul has in mind for writing this text. Our text serves at least these three purposes in the heart and mind of Paul as he writes. One, Paul, in writing 2 Corinthians here, chapter 1, specifically verses 8 through 11 and this text, Paul intends to affirm 
or validate his calling as an apostle. He's going to point to his experience with suffering to do that. Paul intends to affirm or validate his calling as an apostle. The false apostles have labored to discredit Paul. And so throughout 2 Corinthians, Paul is essentially forced to defend himself for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the Corinthians, and for the sake of his ministry among them. Far from being an indication that Paul has been abandoned by God, his suffering is an indication that Paul shares in the sufferings of Christ and that for God glory, for God's glory. Point two, purpose two. Paul is correcting wrong and unbiblical notions of suffering that are propagated by his opponents. That false teaching being spread about Paul, those accusations being spread about Paul, have an impact on the way that people think about their own suffering. May have an impact on the way that you and I think about our suffering. Paul wants to correct that in the minds and the hearts of the Corinthians. He wants to instruct us regarding a right way to think about our suffering. And then thirdly, Paul is equipping the Corinthians. And he's equipping us through this letter, right? He's equipping us to handle our own suffering with a heart for the Lord, with a biblical mindset, with a biblical worldview. And do that as he has learned to do that by God's grace. All genuine Christians have been called to preach the gospel. All genuine Christians have been called into Christian ministry. We've been sent to a lost world. As the Father has sent me, the Lord says, so send I you, right? We're sent into the world with the gospel, just as he was. And we're not greater than our master. So if the world hated him, it's going to hate you and I also, right? And if you are faithful in that calling, if you are faithful as a Christian, if you are pouring yourself out for him, serving his people, serving this lost world with the gospel, then you will know what it means to suffer for him. You will know what it means to suffer. You'll experience fellowship with Christ in the sufferings of Christ. And Paul wants us to have a God-glorifying perspective on this suffering. So understand what Paul is doing through this, right? We're going to learn about suffering. Paul is going to build a theology of suffering. But in this theology of suffering, what he's doing is preparing the Corinthians for their own suffering because Paul, the Bible, Scripture, has charged the Corinthians to preach the gospel to this lost world that hates them. And we have that same charge. If you are going to be faithful, if you're going to be faithful, then you're going to suffer persecution. If you're going to be faithful to Christ, you are going to suffer. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. We need to have a good, God-glorifying, biblical worldview perspective on that suffering. Let's look at our text together. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. God who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Now consider with me as we look at our text, consider with me four lessons that we're to learn from this text. You can find this outline in your bulletin. Point one, we're going to look at the reality of suffering in verse eight. The reality of suffering in verse eight. Point two, we'll consider the purpose of of suffering from verse 9, a purpose of suffering. Point three, we'll look at the sovereign God of suffering from verse 10. And point four, we'll look at the responsibility of suffering in verse 11. The reality of suffering, the purpose of suffering, the sovereign God of suffering, and the responsibility of suffering. Look with me beginning at verse 8 with point one, the reality of suffering. Now, verse 8 begins with that little transitional word for, right there at the beginning, right? That transitional word, that little preposition, begins verse 8 and connects verse 8 to what comes before it, okay? Paul praises God for his unfailing comfort in tribulation, all right, in verse 3. Then he gives a purpose for that God-ordained experience in verses 4 through 6. He says, so that we, we, are, we face suffering and we are comforted so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We have a purpose for 
for trials, a purpose for suffering, and a purpose for God's consolation given in verses 4 through 6. And then he assures them in verse 7 that as they partake of the sufferings of Christ, they will surely partake of God's comfort and consolation in their tribulation. Okay? He gives that excellent theology, verses 3 through 7, and then to explain or to illustrate that theology, Paul gives us a specific example now in verse 8. He says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Now note with me first, Paul's experience with suffering. Paul's experience. Paul would say, in chapter 11, verse 5, we're going to get there eventually, <laughs> that he is not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. He is an eminent apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet here Paul lays out his suffering. So apostles, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, suffer. Paul experiences suffering, and that is an understatement. And he's certainly not ashamed of it. This is what it means. This suffering is what it means. It's an application of... Paul denying himself, taking up his cross, and following Christ in this world. Christian suffering is an application of that command. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ. When you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Christ in this world, you will suffer for Christ. You're going to face difficulty. You're going to face sufferings of Christ, like it says in verse 5. Now, his opponents, false teachers in Corinth, are attacking Paul on this point. And here in chapter 1, right off the bat, so to speak, he steps out to bear that reproach, right? And he wears it as a badge of honor. He wears it as a privilege to suffer for Christ, and he lays it out right here in verse 8, right? Now, the reason that he gives in verse 8 is that he doesn't want them to be ignorant of the suffering that he experienced in Asia, He's using plural pronouns there in verse 8. He uses we and our, if you notice. We would call those editorial plurals. These, this is a very personal account that applies to Paul himself. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of the trouble that he faced in Asia. But then notice, he doesn't give us any details about the trouble. He doesn't tell, tell us what the trouble was. He doesn't really tell us where the trouble was is just in Asia. He doesn't tell us who it involved. He doesn't tell us what happened. That's likely that the Corinthians already knew about it. The Corinthians were aware. These things got around, right? And the details of the trouble are not the point. What Paul doesn't want us to be ignorant about is the reasons for his suffering, the purpose for the suffering, why he suffered as he did. Paul says, yes, brothers, yes, sisters, I suffer. As an apostle of Jesus Christ, I suffer. You know that I do. And to add insult to injury, I'm being attacked for it. And I'm concerned that you might be persuaded by the arguments of my attackers. And so listen up, Paul says. This is important, right? I don't want you to be ignorant of this point. And here's the point. God has a purpose in your suffering. God has a purpose in your suffering. And then, to illustrate that, Paul references the most severe trial that he's ever been through. It's evident that Paul, the apostle, experiences suffering. Note with me the extent of his suffering. We looked at the experience of his suffering. Notice the extent of his suffering. Paul says in verse 8 that they were burdened beyond measure. The word is bareo. It's used of a of a ship. It's so laden down, so loaded down with cargo that as it slips into the water, it starts sinking immediately, right? It doesn't have enough buoyancy to bear up under the weight. Too much cargo, too much weight to bear, and so the ship sinks. The same word is used of a, a beast of burden, a pack animal, that's got so much weight on the animal that its legs buckle and it falls. Can't bear up under the weight, and it just lies there under the weight and dies right where it falls, bareo. The trial was so exceedingly great, it was beyond their capacity to bear. They couldn't handle it. It was outside of their ability to handle. It was, verse 8, beyond or above strength. The weight of it was all just far too great. The circumstances were extreme. The ESV translates it utterly burdened beyond our strength. The RSV, utterly, unbearably crushed. 
And Paul says, such that we despaired even of life. This is a serious trial, a serious event. They lost all hope that they would even survive. The word for despaired there is a really helpful word in the Greek. It's a three-part compound. This one word, a three-part compound word, and the three parts are complete unavailability of a way out. (laughs) No escape, no way out. They were convinced they were going to die. Can you imagine, right? In fact, in verse 9, Paul says, we have the sentence of death in ourselves. Paul essentially, in this trial, and whatever this was, Paul is standing on the gallows, the, the gallows, right? The noose is around his neck. He's standing over the trap door. The noose is tightening, and the executioner has got his hand on the lever. Paul is about to die. He has come to the end of himself. He's come to the end of his rope. They expected not to make it. It's a severe, severe trial. All hope of rescue has vanished. And this from a man who seemed to live at death's door all the time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, Paul says, We stand in jeopardy every hour. This is 1 Corinthians where he says this. I die daily, Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9, we are like men condemned to death. Think about it, right? The dangers, the shipwreck, the beatings. Five times Paul beaten within an inch of his life. The stoning in Lystra. And this exceeds them all. Paul was certain he was going to die. Some speculate about this, that it was a, a severe illness, But an illness doesn't fit here. Paul is referencing the sufferings of Christ in verse 5. It's not an illness. Some speculate that this is referring to the riot that happened in Ephesus. Ephesus was in Asia, the riot that took place in Acts 19. You can read that there in Acts. There are several reasons why that doesn't hold up. This is something else. This is something else. Paul's opponents, essentially... Let's put this in context, right? Paul's opponents are essentially preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. They're preaching word of faith. They're preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. Easy road. The easy road of the Christian life is a sign of God's blessing, a sign of God's approval. And Paul is saying, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. I don't want you to be ignorant. Romans 8, 36, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. You understand, and that's looking at those texts, right? That's Paul's mindset of his suffering. Paul's mindset of what he faces. That's his understanding of his Christian ministry. And he's resolved to it. I'm pouring myself out, Paul says, on the sacrifice and service of your faith. sheep for the slaughter. The theology of the Christian life, the theology of the Christian life is the theology of the cross. And the cross precedes the crown. To follow Christ, to follow Christ, you must have this mind which was also in Christ Jesus, right? You must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him. Paul is rebuking the false teachers here. He's rebuking their notion of suffering. He's rebuking their notion of the Christian life. He's rebuking their pride, their self-reliance. And he's instructing the Corinthians and he's telling us that if you want to faithfully follow Christ, you must deny yourself even to the point of suffering for Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, you must die daily. Deny yourself daily. Die to a life of ease, right? Die to your preferences. Die to your comforts. Die to your desires. Die to yourself. Die to your life and live for him. You must come and die. The call to discipleship is a call to come and die for Christ. And these false teachers, and certainly false teachers today, have this notion that if you follow Christ, everything's going to work out fine. Everything is going to be good when you follow Christ. Christ is going to bless you, right? He is the divine Santa Claus, so to speak, here to make everything fine. Everything go, all your problems go away. That is idolatrous. Paul, in this, in rebuking these false teachers for their notions of the Christian life, their false understanding of the Christian life, 
calls the Corinthians and he calls you and I to die for Christ. He calls you and I out of that life of ease. He calls us out of our comfort, out of our preferences, our desires. He calls us out of living life for ourselves. And he says, come and die. Come and die. The experience of suffering in the Christian life is certain. The extent of suffering may be great, but consider with me the supreme example of suffering. The supreme example of suffering. We have, we have many examples of suffering saints to consider, right? In history, many examples of suffering saints in the Bible. And we look at their examples as we live the Christian life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, note my example, right? Follow my example. Note those who walk like I walk and follow their example. We have great examples. You know, as um, Stephen was being put to death in Acts chapter 7, he was under a, a hailstorm of stones, and they said that, that Stephen's countenance looked like the face of an angel, that he radiated as he stared up into heaven as Stephen is being stoned to death. Stephen, being stoned to death, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Stephen, even in being murdered, was interceding for his murderers. And there, watching the whole scene unfold, was Paul. That had an impact on Paul. That stuck with Paul. Paul mentions, goes back to that account several times. He saw the suffering of that eminent saint as he died for Christ. I'm reading now a biography of Robert Murray Machane, a godly man. It's a wonderful biography. And as I'm reading about him, I'm convicted, right? I am driven. Like, I, I want to emulate what I see in him. Just a heart for the Lord, right? A love for the Lord, a zeal for the Lord. We're given these, these godly examples for that reason. I think the Lord in specifically with respect to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 4, the Lord gives us godly examples in the church to emulate, godly examples to follow. We follow their faith, as Paul says. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? And so as I'm reading the biography of a faithful brother in the Lord, it charges me up to be faithful like he was faithful. It charges me up to imitate him as he imitates Christ. Right, and as I'm reading about McShane, I'm reading McShane's accounts of men that he wanted to emulate, wanted to follow their example. As a young man, he wanted to be a missionary in India, and so he's talking about those missionaries that he wanted to emulate in his work in India. Didn't make it to India, but we have the example, the beautiful example in Scripture of Paul himself. Paul himself. And he tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. We are to follow Paul's example. But also we're to learn from Paul's example. If you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 briefly. We're to learn from Paul's example by witnessing his example under suffering. His example is important on a, on a couple of levels. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 And look there at verse 1. Remember the accusations against Paul, right? There are many. He seems to answer several of them right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, Paul says, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And Paul says, verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So that, what was the purpose of Paul's faithful example under suffering? The purpose of Paul's faithful example under suffering, verse 5, is so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 
It's the effect of a godly example, right? But preeminently, supremely, we have the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. Infinitely far above all of these other examples, we have the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that with me, right? For the sake of wretched, undeserving sinners, Christ suffered. You're sitting here this morning by the grace of God to you, that you can hear the word of God preached, you can see the work of Christ displayed on the pages of Scripture, and you are a wretched, undeserving sinner just like I am, and by the grace of God, we see that Jesus Christ suffered for that. He suffered that you would have that opportunity. He suffered for sinners. He was hungry, he was tired, he was mocked, he was scorned, he was beaten, he was humiliated, he was crucified. And who, for the joy set before him and for the glory of God the Father, he endured the cross. Laid down his life, laid down his life that wretched, undeserving sinners like you and me could have life. I could be reconciled to God. To be set free from the penalty of hell. Set free from the power of sin to serve and to glorify him. One of the ways that the Christian glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ, glorifies God, is by partaking in fellowship with Christ in his sufferings, right? The cross comes before the crown. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God says to the beleaguered Hebrews, he says, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. We've considered point one on your notes, the reality of suffering. The reality of suffering. Suffering is part and parcel with the Christian life. Look with me next at point two. Point two is the purpose of suffering. The purpose of suffering. Verse eight, back in 2 Corinthians chapter one. Verse eight says, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Verse nine, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now, what kind of trouble did Paul face in Asia? Paul faced a death sentence. He faced a death sentence. Why? Why? So that he would and that we would learn to trust exclusively in the one who raises the dead. Now, Paul tells us, he he tells us, Do you know why I was put through such a severe trial, such a hopeless circumstance? Two reasons, two reasons given here. To banish self-reliance and to bolster trust in God. To banish self-reliance and to bolster trust in God. Paul said we have the sentence of death in ourselves. We suffered to the very brink of death itself. Why, right? Why? Someone might cry out in that kind of a circumstance. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening? Paul says, so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. There is a God-ordained purpose to our suffering. There is a God-decreed intention behind our suffering. There is a God-appointed significance in our suffering. Our statement of faith, the London Baptist Confession, 1689, says this. It says that God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his will freely and unchangeably all things whatsoever that come to pass. Now think about that statement. God hath decreed in himself all things whatsoever that come to pass. So take heart, brother. Take heart, sister, right? In your suffering, God has graciously and lovingly designed, decreed, and intended your affliction. He's intended, he's purposed your suffering with a purpose to do you good. To do you good. All things work together for the good of those who are the called, according to his purpose. He intends to mature you through your suffering. He intends to sanctify you through your suffering. 
He wants to help you enjoy his goodness and depend upon his strength, to depend upon his power, to rely upon his comfort, to rejoice in his will, to conform you more into the image of his son. He wants to train you not to trust in yourself, but to trust in God who raises the dead. God who heals the brokenhearted. God who binds up their wounds. God who seats them in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Trust in God. Now that kind intention, that, those smiling providences, as our brother was talking about earlier, that kind intention of God is broken down into two components. One is banishing self-reliance, and two is bolstering trust in God. You've got to put off and put on. Banishing self-reliance and bolstering trust in God. There are going to be times, there are going to be times in your life when you face suffering that you feel rises to the degree that you can't handle it. There will be times when you will face adversity so great you believe you're going to collapse under the weight of it. Any number of reasons for that, right? We consider what Paul considers in verse 5, the sufferings of Christ. That could be severe persecution. And those days, folks, are coming. You consider other suffering that you'll face in the Christian life, suffering that God uses to sanctify you. It could be the loss of a child, loss of a loved one, the loss of a spouse. It could be a cancer diagnosis. And you are put on death's door. Severe pain. You may get to the point where you feel it's a, it's a load too heavy to bear and your legs are buckling and you're going to fall there and die where you lay. Right? Where you despair even of life itself and you would just rather die. And all of that is lovingly and graciously, caringly, compassionately, kindly decreed by God so that you would be sovereignly denied any opportunity for self-reliance. And that for your good, right? So that your strength is sapped so that your supposed wisdom is found completely lacking. You come to the end of your own wisdom and you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. So that you cannot rely on your own ability. You cannot rely on your own plans, your own schemes, your own devices. So that your love of self would be acknowledged as vain and empty, the empty thing that it is, so that your self-centered pride would be put far from you. And all of that, all of that, so that God may do you immeasurable good for his glory. We've got to think biblically about our suffering, small and great, right? One commentator said, hence we may infer how displeasing to God confidence in ourselves must be when for the purpose of correcting it, it is necessary that we should be condemned to death. The extent of Paul's suffering here, the extent of Paul's suffering is the extent to which God must go to rid man of his self-reliance. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's amazing to me thinking of all the ways and the extent to which Paul himself suffered in many ways. Tremendous suffering. And Paul, Paul is still tempted to self-reliance such that God purposes for him a trial of such severity that Paul thought he was going to die. We are weak and prideful and self-reliant creatures, aren't we? Man, that self-reliance shows up in all kinds of ways. And oftentimes, it shows up in ways that we don't realize until we're in the throes of a severe trial. 
We don't see it. We don't get it. And it takes suffering to rise it, to raise it to the top so that dross can be scraped off, right? It takes suffering to get it out. That self-reliance shows up in trials when we neglect to pray, right? When we neglect to pray, neglect to pray and you're saying, I got this, God, right? Do you really want to say that? If you neglect to pray in your Christian life, you're setting yourself up for a fall. You understand, right? You need to be thinking to yourself, if you're not praying, you're not crying out, depending upon God for help, depending upon God for wisdom, God, what do you want for me today, right? What am I to do today? How am I to do it? Give me the strength to do it. If you're not depending upon him in in prayer, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Either that or you're not in him at all. And your heart is cold and indifferent. Indifference, you understand, is on the far side of hate. A neglect to pray is self-reliance. When you begin withdrawing yourself from brothers, withdrawing yourself from sisters, from the church, withdrawing yourself from means, God-appointed means of help, of prayer, of counsel, of wisdom. When you begin making excuses for disobedience, I just don't have time for that right now. I've got too many other things on my plate. Now you're (laughs) self-reliant. And you don't understand that the same God who has decreed these things in his almighty sovereignty is the same God who has appointed the means by which they will be remedied. God appoints the ends and the means. When you're too wise, you're too wise to meditate on his word, to search his word, to seek for understanding. Too wise to understand that you have no wisdom of your own and too wise to go to his word daily to have it, to meditate on it, to let it sink into you, to infuse yourself with it. You're just too wise. All of that is self-reliance. All of that is self-reliance. And oftentimes, it's in difficult trial. It's in adversity. It's when we get ourselves in hot water that we recognize that or acknowledge it. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 says this. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, (laughs) whose heart departs from the Lord. The same man who is self-reliant, that man's heart departs from God. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river, will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. We've got to consider sometimes that if you take a look at your Christian life and you say to yourself, my leaf's not very green. (laughs) I feel a little dry. got to consider whether you are putting your faith in him or relying upon yourself. This is a picture of the self-reliant one, the prideful one, the one who isn't trusting in God. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters, spread out, spreads out its roots by the river, will not fear when heat comes, its leaf will be green. It's amazing that after all that Paul suffered, he's still tempted in these ways. Such is the human heart, right? Deceitful, desperately wicked above all things. Paul's deliverance, when Paul was delivered from this trial, Paul viewed it as a veritable resurrection from the dead, right? Paul viewed this as being from God who raises the dead. And Paul being rescued from this trial was tantamount to him being rescued from death. He learned what it means to trust in God who raises the dead. This, this is what prompts Paul to say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
It's not running the extra five yards to get the football across the goal line. That has nothing to do with this. It's in suffering like this where Paul says, I can make, why, Paul? Is he boasting in himself, in his own strength? No, Paul is boasting entirely in God's power, God's might, God's strength. He would say in 2 Corinthians 4, he said, we're hard pressed on every side, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Paul saw God's deliverance. That brings us to point three. We've seen the reality of suffering. We've seen the purpose of suffering. Let's consider now the sovereign God of suffering. The sovereign God of suffering. Paul says in verse nine, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves so that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivers us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So the God who The God who sovereignly ordains, decrees this suffering, the suffering of his people for their good and for God's glory, is presented in verses 9 and 10 with three characteristics. God is presented here with three characteristics. First, he is the God who raises the dead. He raises the dead. Second, if you look at verse 10, he is the one who delivers from death. And thirdly, he is the one in whom we trust in whom we trust. First, verse 9, he raises the dead. God who raises the dead. This is an attribute of God. It is God and God alone who raises the dead. The verb there, the perfect active participle, essentially means, the grammar essentially means that it's interrupting, this verb interrupting an existing condition or an existing process to establish a new one. In other words, the way it would be worded is this. We should immediately stop trusting in ourselves and start trusting in God. That's our response to our understanding of this text. From this point forward, immediately, stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in God. How do you do that? You pray and you obey and you depend. The one who doesn't obey doesn't trust God. The one who doesn't pray doesn't trust God. You seek his word, right? You seek his face in his word. You learn of him. It is God who raises. That is a present active indicator. It's not God who raised the dead. This is God who raises the dead. Present active. That word there for raises, one said that that is a timeless present participle expressing a permanent attribute of God. God displays his resurrection power by raising his people, delivering his people, raising them from the dead. He is the one who raises the dead. But secondly, he's the one who delivers from death. Verse 10, he delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Notice the three different tenses in that verse. You've got a past, he delivered us. You've got a present, he does deliver us. You have there a future in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. And there's so many examples of that in scripture. God is the one who delivers. God is the one who delivers. We see that pattern established all over the Bible, don't we? Affliction, death, deliverance, affliction, death, rescue, God delivers. Affliction, death, rescue, deliverance. The most notable one that comes to mind is Abraham, right? Abraham, and Abraham is told to take the son of promise, his only son Isaac, take him across the desert to the Mount Moriah, to Mount Moriah, and to sacrifice Isaac there on the mountain to God. So Abraham says, does not delay. The Bible says Abraham doesn't delay. He packs up, he brings the materials necessary for the sacrifice, and he takes off for the mountain. As they are nearing the mountain, and Abraham sees the mountain afar off, he tells the servant that is traveling with him, you stay and wait here. Me and the boy will be back. Now, why would Abraham say that? Because (laughs) Abraham worships the God who raises the dead. This was a promised son to Abraham, the child of promise. Abraham knows that God keeps his promises, and Abraham knows that God raises the dead. In Abraham's mind, 
Might have well as been that I'm going to sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God. God's going to raise him from the dead and we'll be back in a, in a day or two, right? All kinds of examples like that, right? God is the one who delivers. The Israelites go to the, the foot of the Red Sea. The Pharaoh and his armies are bearing down on them and God is the one who delivers. The story of Gideon in Judges chapter 7 where God continues to dwindle the numbers of the armies of Israel to the point where there's 300 left and God says, so that for the purpose that the victory would not be credited to your strength or your power, but to mine. God is the one who delivers and God will do that for his glory. God sets a giant across the field from a beleaguered Israelite army and he puts before the giant a ragtag, scrawny boy who can't even walk in the armor. And God is going to win that victory by the hand of that boy. Not by their power, not by their arm, not by their might, but by God's power, by God's might. So many examples in scripture of that, right? God is the one who delivers. Thirdly, he is the one in whom we place our trust. Listen, verse 10 says that Paul says here in verse 10, he has delivered us from death. He is delivering us from death and we trust in him that he will deliver us from death. If you're here today, you've never turned from your sin. You've never put your faith and trust in Christ. You've not entrusted yourself to him, right? You've never said to the Lord, listen, take my life. I've made a wreck of it. I want you to rule and reign over me. I want you to have it, Lord. Take it. If you've never turned to entrust yourself to him by faith, then you are on your way to an everlasting death. The Bible calls it the second death. You will stand before God at the great white throne. The books of his judgment, the books of his law will be opened. And he's going to judge you according to your works whether you've done good or evil. And what have you done? You have done evil. The thoughts and intents of your heart have been only evil continually since your birth. In sin, your mother conceived you. You will presume to stand before the God of the universe, the God who made you, your creator, in the filthy rags of your unrighteousness, and God will judge you according to his law in perfect righteousness, in perfect justice. And in perfect justice, the verdict already being rendered that you are guilty, he will cast you into hell forever. The Bible calls that the second death. Who is the one that delivers from death? God alone. Who is the one who raises the dead? God alone alone. Who is your only hope, your only hope of deliverance? God alone. The gospel, the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He sent his only begotten son, his only begotten son, that where you fail to live a day in your life for him, Jesus Christ lived every day for him. He obeyed him perfectly, every thought, every word, every deed. He perfectly satisfies the law of God, fulfills the law of God, where you and I could not. He perfectly obeys, and then he goes to the cross as a sacrifice for sin. That picture of Abraham and Isaac, a picture of God's grace and mercy in Christ to deliver up his own son, that sinners, wretched sinners like you and I could be saved. That if you will entrust yourself to him by faith, if you will turn from your sin and live for him, he will save you, forgive you, reconcile you to himself, give you eternal life, everlasting life. He is the one who raises the dead. That is the one in whom Paul trusts that he will still deliver him. That's an eschatological deliverance. Paul's saying he has delivered us from death. Listen, he's delivered Paul from death physically, death practically, death spiritually. He continues to deliver Paul from death physically, death spiritually, and he will future deliver Paul from death physically and spiritually. One day, Paul will die 
because all sinners will die and Paul will be raised from the dead. And Paul knows it. He trusts, in whom we trust, that he will still deliver us. He is trusting in the God who raises the dead. Point four, we have a responsibility then in our suffering. We've seen the reality of suffering, the purpose of suffering. We've considered the sovereign God, one who is sovereign over our suffering. And point four, we consider our responsibility in suffering. Verse 11. We trust, Paul says in verse 10, that he will still deliver us. Verse 11, you also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. How will Paul's deliverance be effected by faith? How will your deliverance be effected? Your deliverance will be effected through faith. That here expressed in prayer. By you, Paul says in verse 11, helping together with me in prayer. The verb there is an attendant circumstance, which means that the deliverance is contingent upon the prayer. You will be delivered through prayer. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God decrees all things, ordains all things whatsoever that come to pass. And that same sovereign God has ordained the means by which they come to pass. And here, the means by which this deliverance comes to pass is prayer. God's deliverance secured by the means of the prayers of his people. It's the effect, if you will, of prayer. The expression of our faith, the acknowledgement of our weakness, our dependence upon God, the acknowledgement of our need of him, our dependence on him, is all expressed in prayer. We pray in praise, in worship. We glorify God through prayer. All of that, Paul says, verse 11, that, so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. In other words, so that God will be praised. God will be glorified. God will be worshiped. We pray for the glory of God, for him to win the victory. He wins the victory. He's the only one who does. We acknowledge him in that. God is faithful, and God chooses to exercise his faithfulness through the means of the faithfulness of his people. God doesn't need our prayer. He doesn't need your prayer. He doesn't need my prayer. He doesn't need that. God ordains that it should be so. And he does this with two aspects, if you will, if you look at this verse. One, there's a Godward aspect. When you pray, there's a Godward aspect. We trust him in prayer, through prayer. We depend upon him. We express our faith in him, and we glorify him. There's a Godward aspect to that necessity of prayer. There's also a manward aspect to it. When you and I pray, we bolster our own faith, right? We squash our own self-reliance. We pour contempt on our own pride when we pray. We express our dependence upon him. There's a manward aspect. Philip Hughes said this. He says, in prayer, human impotence casts itself at the feet of divine omnipotence. I love that. Thus, the duty of prayer is not a modification of God's power, but the duty of prayer is a glorification of it. Human impotence casting itself at the feet of divine omnipotence. God is glorified in demonstrating the, surpassness, the surpassing greatness of his grace and power in man's weakness. We are to endure suffering for his sake. And in enduring suffering for his sake, we're to glorify him through it. When we glorify him through it, it's a testimony to the lost world. It's a testimony to brothers and sisters. As Paul said, we can comfort one another with the same comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. There's a purpose. There's a meaning. There's an intent in our suffering. Pray, right? Pray. Trust the Lord. Lastly, let me leave you with this. All of this... In context here, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, is a charge for you and I to lay down our lives for him. The Christian life is not merely avoidance. 
Don't do this. Don't do that. Many people live their Christian lives that way, right? Go to church every week. They sit and they listen to some guy talk, some gal talk. <laughs> and as that person talks, it's just, it's a nice sounding gong or clanging cymbal. They hear the talk and they go home. Their Christian life consists of trying not to do this or trying not to do that. They come back the next Sunday and listen, that's it. The Christian life is not merely avoidance. The Christian life is laying down your life for Christ, denying yourself, taking up your cross daily and following him. You can't strive to live, as one commentator put it, an untroubled Christian life. You must, as Spirit of God says, letter of Hebrews, go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, obeying his commands, preaching his gospel, pouring yourself out on the sacrifice and serving of the service of the faith of the brothers and sisters at this church, loving one another, serving one another, preaching the gospel with one another. You must discomfort yourself for the gospel. Discomfort yourself for the body. And Paul wraps this all up. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, with these words. Therefore, Paul says, we don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is re being renewed day by day. And then he makes this statement that is staggering in context. For our light affliction. That's what Paul calls it. Consider all the suffering of Paul. Paul calls it a light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Let's take a few moments and I want you to pray silently as we do. And I want to go before the Lord and consider how we can faithfully and fervently serve him. Not shrinking back from discomfort, but going forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, suffering for his name. And consider how good and gracious the Lord is in all our suffering and trials, how we may glorify him in them. Amen. Amen.